Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. We have been far from regular the last few weeks, but I hope you can forgive me. Uh, I'm privately I'm in the process of moving and uh, we're leaving a house that we lived in for 20 years. So um, yeah, very little spare time for hobbies and stuff like that. So. But this time we will bring something to the table because there has been uh, or have been uh, a few recent releases that I would like to bring your attention to. And they were all uh, done by members of the group Nostalgia. So over to tape stuff from Nostalgia. Okay, let's start with this. It's actually not what I promised you because this is not from Nostalgia, but it is one of those things that you basically need to have. It's device emulator and let's move to this screen. So it looks like normal and uh, of course like the emulator, the font looks a bit weird, but that might be, be me. Um, so uh, when you see this, you might have access to the version 3.8, which is the new one. Uh, but I will just show you, and this is recorded a number of days before, but uh, most of the functions are, are absolutely as they will be when you, when you download it. So uh, let's see here. So let's, let's talk about the few of the news in the version 3.8. Uh, WIC, that's the uh, wireless interface card, so it's, uh, it's basically a Wi-Fi module. Fixes to the virtual device. Uh, one of the things that I had issues with was the FFmpeg. So if, if you use Vice to record stuff directly, they have a, a, uh, replaced the FFmpeg with this um, ZMBV format instead. It generates, uh, I think it's AVI, AVI files, and um, yeah, I've just used it once, and um, and it works fine. The issue I had before was because I'm building Vice myself, uh, I needed to have an older FFmpeg, and if I um, upgraded my MSYS2 environment, it also upgraded to a newer FFmpeg, and that wasn't supported, so I had to roll back that simple portion. And it was a nuance every time I, I updated everything. So I'm really happy and this seems to work fine. And uh, and I don't have any like religious view over which library <laughs> generates the best thing. As long as it works, I'm absolutely fine. And, and this ZMBV seems to work fine. So I'm absolutely happy with this. Uh, a lot of recent things fixed, printer, yeah, don't care much about printer, but it's great that it works, of course. Uh, fixes to tape, fixes to serial handshakes, um, drives. Yeah, something about 1571 CR. Um, yeah, and, and um, if you do more than 80 tracks on a three and a half inch drive, that was added also. Um, yeah, RAM expansion unit stuff and uh, yeah more printer stuff uh palette files uh, runtime cia shift registers fixed that seems to be rather important right i mean anything that relies on cia would need this i don't know uh and z80 that would be uh, that needs to be on the um uh, yeah, only on the uh, 128 mode of that, or or even the CPM mode. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. So a number of fixes. Uh, let's see the portion I am most interested in, the C64 fixes. Uh, Max Basic. Yeah, I can't say that these are things that are really needed to me. But uh, yeah, anyways, so when you see this do have a lookout for an updated version of vice 3.8 stay current i know a number of people uh, keep the old version because the uh, the warp mode is faster and uh, yeah so be it but you are risking not taking full advantage of the added features of the newer versions and also the um, increased emulation on the newer versions 
we had people running um, alternate reality uh, on uh, the C64. And I think that's based on a rather old instance of Vice. Uh, and, and it bugged for that reason. It works absolutely fine when you run it on, on stock hardware. And it also runs fine if you run it on uh, like a current version of Vice on basically any platform and that we have tried it on. So do keep updated with Vice 3.8 to be released on Christmas Eve. Yeah, let's see what we have here. So, um, one of the more competent guys doing cracking on the C64 is Fungus from Nostalgia. He has been doing um, this for a very long time and he also did a number of transfers. Quite recently, he launched uh, a, f a set of them. Uh, let's see if I have the... Um... So it's for Bleep Load, Burner, Ocean Imagine, Procast, Racket, and Wild Load. Um, several of these are now built a bit different and you have seen uh, the previous episode I hope where I also did a tape transfer so what he has done is he has done an implementation that needs the RAM expansion unit to to run it so you run it on the native C64 you need a Ryu and then you insert your tape and then this will do the work for you so what I have here is bleep load tape transfer 2.3. Um, he did a, a few fixes of this. The package is super impressive. He has done so much work. So uh, first of all, you have uh, the, the full source of the transfer is available to you. So that's one thing. Let's see if I can have that one on the screen here. Uh, yes, something like this. I'll just scroll through it so you see the amount of code that is running. And you see the uh, number of, com of um, comments as well. So if, if you have any sort of problem reading this, it w it's not because uh, Scott has been lazy in his commenting. It's, it's, uh, it's really, really well documented and very structured. So you would have like headings for the bigger sections and, and a number of like the key lines of what the, um, of, of code they are commented. So you can, you can get an indication of what is meant by each of them. And, uh, the code is super well structured as well. So there nothing to complain about here whatsoever. Uh, and then let's throw in this one. So I just took one of them. I mean, he has launched a number of them, but uh, here you would see the bleep load support. So these are the games that are supported. And I'm sorry that um, yeah, you would need a bigger screen for this or the tab is set wrong. Something is because uh, yeah, when I look at this uh, on the bigger screen than this one you are seeing now, then then this looks absolutely fine. But you have a number of, what is it, like 78 different games supported. And then um, since Bleep Load is sort of a platform where there is a one version and then that one is ex expanded on. So you have type one and type two. So, um, and this is well described as well. Let's see what he provided as well. Okay, so bleep load one, two, three. Um, it seems the chaos engineer, Luigi Fraya, whom you should have seen also on the channel. He also did a number of um, comments on this originally. And it seems Scott has been building on that. Um, yeah, so you have that documentation if you want to know more about this loader type. What else? What else? Control. Here you would have a control file. It's again, it's a disassembly and he commented it super well and structured it really well for full understanding. And it's a lot of text here. So great work scott it's super impressive and this is just one of the loaders that you have documented so thoroughly 
and are and you are also releasing this to anybody who would like to use it so let's just start it uh, this one is just sitting there waiting for me to press play um, i will do just that and i will fast forward Okay, so now it starts transferring the stuff and uh, block number and load address. So it seems that this one is loading to blocks. My initial thought was that he would be storing stuff into the RAM expansion unit just so that he wouldn't need to save throughout the process, just store everything to the RAM expansion unit. But uh, he is actually saving in between the segments here. And uh, the game I picked was Dynamic Duo. Um, again, some some there there are a number of games supported, and uh, I just picked a random one. Um, I actually picked uh, Batman: The Caped Crusader, but the version I had didn't support bleep load. It was something else. Yeah, and this is sped up, of course. So um, I'm I'm running in warp mode. Uh, the exit here is a bit weird. It, it's not detecting that it's it's ending. Uh, so it's sitting here and uh, I guess uh, it's not even running. So play is still pressed and the tape is still sort of continuing even if the, pre uh, the tape has ended. And uh, we do have now all the files on list. So... I, I just copied and I used the 1581 <laughs> image just to be sure that everything would fit, um, which it did quite nicely. So bleep load 2.3, that's the file here. And then you have bleep load control. Again, if you want to read the details on this particular transfer, it's it's there in amongst uh, Scott's uh, documents. Uh, and 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 what these are, you would have uh, you would have a number of files transferred, and then seemingly there is a jump to somewhere, and then it loads another file, and then there is a jump. So he stores the jump, so that you can see that there is a jump here, and and you can follow the sequence. Uh, if you look at how I did my transfer, I wasn't transferring any of that uh, data. So the S, uh, the sequential file here is the information on the jump that is executed between the loads here. It, so he's basically showing you how the, the loader process goes and files loaded and where it actually then also executes part of the, the code it has loaded. So super nice work, Scott. It's really amazing. And I would encourage all of you to download his uh, transfer from CSDB and try them on the tapes. And if you find anything that's flawed or missing or, or could be improved on, I'm sure uh, Scott would pick that up and, and uh, continue his great work in producing transfers for the C64. Okay, so the previous transfer was run inside the emulator on the C64. So it's basically running the stock machine, requiring a RAM expansion unit, so be it. But, uh, but it's still running inside the C64 and it's transferring using like the C64. Uh, and uh, it's communicating via the tape bus, um, assuming that there is a tape there. Um, so it, it does work from a real native C64 tape. The other program that I have been showing uh, has been just recently updated. So Tapex, uh, Tom of Nostalgia, so SLC of Nostalgia, updated tapex to version 2.0 and the key difference between this and what you've saw, seen previously is that this one is assuming a tap file so it's already assuming the file in a format where you transfer tape to be used with emulators but this one isn't just doing that. That's a massive thing and it's great. And it's been working for a long time. And the improvements on this one, is, 
there are numerous of improvements, but that alone wouldn't justify a jump from 1.7 uh, up until 2.0. The key difference here is that this one also supports that you read uh, a pure, like a sample. So if you take um, an audio tape from a tape deck or whatever, uh, so no C64 involved, but you take the tape from a C64 and you put that in a normal tape deck and then you record it as if it was like music on the tape. This one can take that sample file and convert that into a tap. Uh, there has been uh, additional, or I, I've seen a number of other programs. I think Marcus Brenner has done, uh, what's that, MTAP or, or something. I think MTAP is the name of, of Marcus Brenner's program doing like a similar thing. But uh, so Tom has implemented that. It's, it's in this program, but it's also released as a separate program. It's called, um, is it XTAP? XTAP. XTAP one zero uh, one zero one. So it's uh, I, I don't know if there was a one one dot zero and then he did a small fix and it's a one zero uh, one. Uh, and and let's take Dynamic Duo, the one that we had before. Uh, yeah, you can see it takes a few seconds for it to scan. These are the loaders. It's the program is supporting. So it's a wide range of loaders and if you would like if you already know the the loader type of the particular tape that you are feeding to it you can disable the other ones and uh, and you would have a faster scanning process because it would not need to identify the particular one that you're feeding it but if it takes three seconds who cares then let the program do its work and, and it's less hassle for you so you have a report here. Uh, that one is is printing the different segments. Uh, yeah, so you see here a number of segments loaded and you have an information set per segment uh, view. Uh, yeah, so you see the different segments basically. So the segments you see here would be basically the same as you saw here on the report page, uh, but view. Let's do file details of that particular one. So that is from B600 to B6FF. That's one segment here. Yeah, that's that. Uh, and of course, the really cool thing is, uh, let's see that one and let's do like that. And you can have, a, so already here, you can do a full disassembly of the program. Um, which is super convenient. Uh, of course, if you got get into the the data it reads, uh, this yeah. Uh, well, normally this could actually be uh, encrypted, but seemingly uh, bleep load isn't using uh, any decryption for it or uh, encryption for this. So uh, you can actually read it. Uh, the disassembly here uh, fully plain. Right, and, and if you have a number of those things and you want to see them as hex, you can see them as hex and uh, yeah, whatever, that's, that's hex. So, Tapex 2.0 by SLC of Nostalgia. So, Tom, great work from also this Nostalgia member. Really impressed. Um, yeah. You have done amazing work and these are for sure programs that you would like to pick up if you are interested in hacking in uh, the low level stuff on the C64 because tools like Tapex makes life a lot easier. And also the most recent Vice version makes life so much easier. Yeah, so congratulations for a super nice release, Tom. I really like this program. All right, so there is one additional program I would like to show you, and it's called Nova. Um, um, probably this is a program you haven't really tried, but anybody who is familiar with Assembly 64 would, uh, would have used that program to access their collection and then pressing, uh, just double clicking on the program, and it starts nicely in the emulator. So uh, SLC, Tom, has done something which is sort of the same thing, but really not. 
uh, Nova 64 is a program for handling your um, collection of tap files. So if you have a collection of tape files, then this is the thing for you. And there is always the opportunity of downloading the most recent version of Ultimate Tape Archive, which is up to version 4. Uh, Tom indicated that version 4.5 is just to be released, but uh, I'll just show you here uh, quite a plain GUI. Um, I'll just set the uh, config for you. So you need to point to a database file. Uh, you can generate that database using one of Tom's other program, which is sort of the, yeah, the program for managing a tap collection. This one is more the front end for launching programs from that collection. So uh, otherwise, uh, one option will be just to download Ultimate Tape Archive and use Nova as the front end because that is the easiest way to kind of access the content of that collection or you use uh, the you generate your own tape uh, collection using that other program which i should remember the name of hmm what was it tape manager so if you look at csdb on uh, and look at nova there is also uh, in the first comment is by tom himself and that one points to the tape manager program Okay, so what I do is I point to the database file, I point to the root archive of that, uh, the, um, the, well, basically the directory where the database is. And then I just set a path to my emulator. Uh, and please mind that here you can also use, use Nova 64 tape adapter. I think that's something that you connect to real C64 and sort of make that tape available for a real 64. And then uh, the the viewers, I just use Windows internal things, so I didn't need to define that. And if I want to export the tap for whatever reason, then, then there is a, a path to the export directory here. And I didn't touch this, but uh, this is how you set up the parameters to feed the emulator properly. Okay, so here you just, you just have a look. I mean, it's a long list of programs that are available now in the uh, Ultimate Tape Archive. Uh, Rodland, uh, yeah, seemingly there there is an option for Rodland. Yeah, Rodland came with two-sided tape, so this is side one and this is side two. It uses Snake Load. It's launched by Kix in 1993, and uh, you have the inlay here. Oh, you didn't have an inlay. <laughs> Sorry, I picked a, a, a bad one. Uh, yeah, let's let's see uh, this or Rambo three. That should surely have an inlay, right? No, it didn't. Bad. Rainbow Island inlay. No. It's really bad. Ah, sorry, my mistake. So uh, in the in the uh, in the config here, you can say you auto load the inlays and you auto load the docs. Uh, I deselected that so that uh, the interface would be a bit snappier. But uh, so here you need to press front and back to ensure that you sort of get that. Okay, so I could possibly have received the inlay for that thing. Okay, so. Front inlay, yeah, bad cat. Now it works. Okay, so that is what that configuration is doing. I I realize I really want the inlays and the docs to be auto loaded. And uh, let's see, bazooka bill inlay, yes, works nicely. Beachhead, yeah. Give me a suggestion of a game that I should try. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Cobra, we, we'll have that. Good suggestion. Cobra. So here you have Cobra. Uh, that's the tap file. Sometimes there are indexes here, tap index on, on offsets. So you can jump to different offsets on the tape. I guess that's for collection tapes. If you want to have like 
a game number two starts on a certain offset. Um, yeah, I haven't tried that. I'm rather new to the program. I just what I just would like to show you this. So Cobra tap, Vice starts, and we're all good. Should we have? Yeah, we should, of course, do warp mode to ensure it faster. The brilliant ocean loader music. Yeah, one of the versions. Okay, so the reason you don't hear it now is because I turned warp mode on again. So it's loading, loading, loading. Yeah. And and this is a regular tape load. The, nothing is different. It's just the ease of access to a collection of tape. For that, you should use Nova 64. SLC, Tom, splendid work. Looks really nice. Very clean, very neat, very easy access. A program that you should absolutely have. Okay, C64 Debugger is also one of the programs where Marcin has been doing continuous updates and uh, I am rather involved in giving him feedback on a regular basis. It's a massively cool program. My only issue with it is that he's building it on a, an older version of Vice, which means that yeah, the, the, the root of the emulation is... Uh, is not the most current one, which is a bit annoying, but uh, there are a few patches he needs to the core vice. And uh, in an ideal word, world, it would work a bit like the ICU emulator, where you have sort of the standard vice in the beginning uh, as a basis, and then the uh, the function of a program such as C64 Debugger would be additional windows or views of the running programs that you could evoke. But uh, yeah, that's not how it works. Uh, so um, C64 Debugger is released as a separate program built on the device that uh, sort of was branched off when he implemented it. Okay, so uh, let's just show you a bit of this. Uh, let's see if this might work. I'm dumping dynamic duo here to this one, uh, and then we do load settings. And I'm I'm sorry about this being rather small, but the program is sort of assuming they have a rather big screen because there are so many views that you might want to have. Uh, settings C64 uh, data set. And then play, yes. Okay, so what I have here, um, I built my own um, sort of workspaces. And uh, this is the one which I called Pontus Main. So I have the C64 CPU up here, a C64 disassembly. It's running here. C64 screen and the memory map and then a memory view and a set of breakpoints. And also here would be the... Uh, the uh, vice monitor. Uh, so I'm I'm using the. You can select between uh, C64 Debugger's own um, monitor, or you can use the vice monitor. And I've chosen to use the vice monitor because it has a number of features that I fancy. Uh, yeah, why? I can show you here that workspaces. So I have a Vic workspace where I still have the disassembly. I still have the screen. And here I can set C64 raster breakpoints uh, based on the number of criteria. I have the visualization of how the Vic is set. Again, a memory view and a memory map, uh, char set control. And uh, yeah, what this looks a bit squeezed in yeah i think that one was sort of only thrown in there in the last minute 
So and again, you would see that the the screen memory here is on 0400, the font is on 1000, and the uh, yeah whatever that that would be the bitmap. So that wouldn't even be applicable. So the, the Vic is is setting that. Mm, seemingly something is happening here with the tape not loading. So but let's skip that. I I have another view, and uh, again it might look a bit cramped because. But normally I use my entire screen and here I needed to have a bit of a small window so you can see anything, which means that my the windows inside this bigger panel is, uh, they're not positioned as I normally have them. But C64 disassembly and C64 CPU, the C64 screen, memory map. But here I also have uh, the 1541 memory and, um, and the 1541 LED. And I have a... 1541 memory map here and this is the disassembly of the 1541 running and i have breakpoints here as well and the c64 and the device monitor here as well but it is super convenient if you're writing something like a fast loader or or debugging something on the c64 where you need to have control both of the computer and the uh, the 1541 or disk drive or any disk drive for that matter it's really convenient to have them working here in in tandem. Sometimes you you find that the PC starts is there spinning and uh, it looks like it's waiting for something to happen, a handshake on the serial bus. And the reason for that being that the 1541 has crashed on that side. Then then you can see this normally rather easy by the C the 1541 disassembly being stuck. Okay, uh, workspace, uh, yeah, I had a SID workspace. I, I haven't really used this, but if you want, would like to kind of see just how the SID works, uh, you would have that view and, and uh, a few of the basic things running for the, um, like what, what is running on the 6.4. Marcin, great work. I know you have lots of additional work before this is ready for release, but uh, you have been done doing an amazing effort to make this work. And for most part, this is overwhelmingly cool. So great work, Marcin, uh, Marcin and uh, wishing you and Tom and Scott and Gröpas and all the other guys in the Vice team a very Merry Christmas and also to you for watching this. This is the last episode for the year. I'm pretty sure I will not be able to make another one before New Year. I hope I can start doing new ones at the beginning of the year in January. So see you then and thank you so much for watching and wishing you a super happy end of 2023. Bye-bye.